learning theory, behaviorism. There are unconditioned rewards. Those are rewards you don't have to learn. Those are the things that bring a motivated state to its closure, roughly speaking. And that makes you satisfied, satiation. That, by the way, is associated with serotonin. Serotonin is a satiating neurochemical. So if your levels of serotonin are high, you're kind of satisfied, which means you don't experience a lot of positive emotion or a lot of negative emotion. You're just kind of satisfied. It's a high dominance thing. It's like all the consumatory rewards are there when you need them. You don't have to worry and you don't have to get too excited. Conditioned rewards or incentive rewards indicate progress towards a consumatory reward. They can be learned or conditioned, but they can also be innate and they're associated with dopaminergic activation and that's the exploration circuit that comes out of the hypothalamus. Half the hypothalamus does goal specification and the other half does exploration. And so, again, if you're pursuing something that's an identifiable goal and you fail, well then you're going to back off, that's negative emotion, then you're going to start to explore. And that's that dopaminergic circuit. What's associated with dopaminergic activation? Exploration, extroversion, happiness, play, enthusiasm, assertiveness, and the positive element of novelty. Okay, so that makes sense. Anybody have any questions? I know that's a lot of information, but I, I kind of designed this part of the course so that at this point the levels of analysis would stack up so that you could understand them simultaneously. So, the hypothalamus sets up your frames of motivation. Running one of those to, the, to its positive conclusion, that's satisfying. That's innate. It's, cons it's consumatory reward. You'll work for that. Anything that indicates that that might happen, that's incentive reward. You can learn that, but some of it's also innate which is where the, the behaviors didn't know that because they thought of all, the, all the, the secondary stuff, the conditioned stuff, as learned. It's not all learned. Some of it's already prepared. You see a, th a snake? That's a threat. You don't have to learn that. So, fire is sort of like that as well. Um, blood is like that. Teeth are like that. Staring eyes are like that. Predatory postures are like that. Um, loud, loud vocalizations, especially if they're like low, low in... Uh, Frequency, they indicate a large animal. All those things are things you don't have to learn to be afraid of because they've been so consistently dangerous in the past that you've built up a circuit that responds automatically to them. Question? Um, the extroversion and neuroticism, like, it seems like they're, well, at least in the example that you gave, that um, they're kind of mutually exclusive, or, that as, or do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's complicated, you know, because they do play a bit of an inhibitory role, but they're separate circuits, mm -hmm. you know, so you can be very extroverted and very high in negative emotion. Okay. So, and you can be very emotionally stable and very low in extroversion, too. So, but they are definitely separate things. Now, it's hard, you know, you can flip from laughing to crying very rapidly. You know, so people are very much capable of experiencing mixed states of positive and negative emotion. Plus, there are forms of manic depressive disorder where people are manic and depressed at the same time, which I wouldn't recommend. The people I know that have had that, they, they seem to think that is certainly not fun. So, agitation. Okay. Tremendous agitation. Okay. So you, you're probably sort of like that when you're deeply confused and you're really bothered by it. Because then the threat circuits are going, but you're also sort of wandering around going, oh, what am I going to do? That's all, that's all like approach behavior. Approach motivation isn't always positive, eh? I mean, most of the time it is, but intensity matters and controllability matters too. So, okay. Unconditioned punishments. Fundamentally, they produce pain. They also tend to... Ha, if you run a behavioral routine or a motivated framework that results in punishment, you're less likely to run it again in the future. That's learning. If you run a motivated frame and it works, you're more likely to run it in the future. That's learning too. So, unconditioned punishments decrease the probability that you're going to run a given motivational frame because it, it, it failed, right? You, you ran it and you, you got hurt. It's like, don't do that again. That's part of the purpose of memory. And the pain-like emotions, just to say it again, are pain, frustration, disappointment, grief, sadness is in there as well. 
So those are pain-like states of emotion. Conditioned punishments. Those are things that indicate that a punishment is likely. Some of them you can learn, some of them you don't have to, because they're already built into you. The negative emotions are dampened by serotonin. That's the fundamental brain system, fundamentally. The serotonergic system is like a conductor of the orchestra. It keeps everything in, in balance. And GABA. GABA is a anxiolytic. It makes people less anxious. It's endogenous. Your brain produces it. If you take Valium or barbiturates, they act on the GABA system, and so does alcohol. That's part of the reason why people like alcohol, because it dampens anxiety. Now, for some people, alcohol also produces dopaminergic activation. So they really like alcohol because it calms them down, like they're not anxious anymore, and it, it also feels, it produces incentive reward activation like cocaine. So for some people, alcohol is an absolutely deadly drug. You can probably find out if you're susceptible to alcoholism quite straightforwardly. If you want to find out, sit in a bar, take your pulse, down five shots, <laughs> four shots if you're little. You gotta get your, you gotta get your blood alcohol level above legal intoxication or you won't be able to tell. And then take your pulse again 10 minutes later. If your pulse has gone up eight beats or more, watch it. Because you're probably producing an opiate response to alcohol. Secondary consequence of the opiate response is a dopaminergic response reasonable probability that you'll like alcohol enough to find it difficult to stop drinking once you start. Some of you are probably like that, right? You have a few drinks, it's like, yee-haw! <laughs> that's how we do it in Alberta, anyways. So, <laughs> so part of that's cueing the incentive reward system, and because it's an approach system, and it's being cued by the alcohol, you just continue to hit it. And the dopamine kicks only occur as your blood alcohol level is rising. So you have to keep nailing it, nailing yourself with alcohol, because otherwise your blood alcohol level won't keep rising and you won't get that nice enthusiasm and assertiveness that goes along with the positive element of alcohol. <clears throat> neuroticism. So this is the neuroticism dimension. Um, there's a gender difference in neuroticism. Women are about half a standard deviation higher negative emotion than men. It seems like a cross-cultural universal. The difference is more enhanced in egalitarian states like Scandinavia, which is exactly the opposite of what you'd presume, right? If you were, a, say, a, uh, a radical, I can't remember the name. If you're someone who believes that everything occurs as a consequence of socialization, as you equalize a society, the g gender differences in personality become larger rather than smaller. So, which is, you know, not what anybody expected, but that's what happened. So. Boys and girls seem to have about the same level of negative emotion, but as soon as puberty hits, women become higher negative emotion than men. On average, there's still a lot of overlap between the genders, and it never goes away again across the life course once it kicks in in puberty. And the reasons for that, women are smaller, their, their upper bodies are weaker, so they're more physical, they're, they're at a physical disadvantage if they're in a dominance dispute, they're sexually vulnerable, Plus, they have to take care of infants. So I think those four things are probably enough to tilt the nervous system of women more towards negative, negative emotion. I've often thought maybe that women's emotional systems, the negative ones in particular, are actually not tuned to the woman. I think they're tuned to the woman-infant combination. So, you know, if you think about it from an, if you think about it for a bit, it almost has to be that way because an infant has to be carried around for like a year and a half. And so, at that point, when you have an infant, and maybe you're going to have ten, you know, you guys won't, but in the evolutionary past that would have been the case, you'd have an infant for a mu much of your life, and then you'd be a grandmother and have an infant. It's like, why wouldn't your nervous system be tuned at puberty for the two of you instead of one of you? So, how, how could it be any other way? Anyways. So, You've got your hypothalamus, and then on top of that, you've got some circuits that deal with memory and emotion. So I'm going to run you through the hippocampus and the amygdala relatively quickly. So this is a theory that was basically put together by Sokolov, who was a Russian neuropsychologist back in 1962, but it's a variant of a theory that Norbert Weiner developed back in the 40s. So here's the idea. You wander through the world, and you, if you're in a place that you know, your memory systems... The hippocampus looks inside your memory systems. 
to see what it is that you want to have happen based on your understanding of the world. Okay? So, you're in a motivated state, but you have certain expectations that make sense within that state. So the hippocampus is watching what you think is going to happen. But remember, that's motivated. It's not just expectation. And then the hippocampus is also looking at the world. Now, it, it's looking at an interpretation of the world because you can't help but interpret the world. But fundamentally, the hippocampus is looking inside you and outside you. And then it's seeing if what's happening inside and what's happening outside are the same. Which means you know what you're doing and you know where you are. And if they're the same, so if it detects a match, then the hippocampus inhibits the amygdala and the hypothalamus, roughly speaking. Now what it actually seems to do, there's a little circuit in your brain stem called the reticular activating circuit. And it's the thing that turns your brain on at night if you're sleeping and you hear a noise that you shouldn't hear. It's like bang, you're awake. It's the reticular activating system way down in your brain stem. Puts your cortex into a high arousal state and poof, you're conscious. Now, the hippocampus tells the reticular activating system to basically remain calm as well as, as long as what, it's, what you're expecting and desiring and what's happening are the same thing. So it's sort of like it's saying, I know you could jump up and freak out and run about, but you don't have to right now because everything's going according to plan. But as soon as there's a deviation, that's anomaly, say, then the hippocampus says, whoa, something's wrong here. And the, it disinhibits the reticular activating system. That turns on your emotions, especially your negative emotion. But it primes your positive emotion and it primes some of the hypothalamic circuits too or disinhibits them because one way of solving the fact that something isn't going well is to switch to something else. So it's sort of like there's a bunch of circuits on underneath you but they're being held back like r r horses in a racehorse. And then something that you don't expect happens and the gates come up a little bit because then you're prepared. Now a lot of that's negative emotion. Oh, oh, you don't know where you are. But a lot, of, a lot of the rest of it is, be prepared to do whatever the hell you might need to do next. And so anomaly, the hippocampus detects anomaly, that's something unexpected, and then it disinhibits your lower circuitry and it gets you ready to go. Now, the problem is, how worried should you be when something that you don't expect happens? And the answer to that is, you don't know. That's a big problem with life because, now, something went wrong. Here's the possibilities. You're not looking at the world right. So it's actually a perceptual problem, right? Like Gray, for example, believes that you just see the world just like it is because he's sort of a behaviorist. It's full of stimuli. You don't have to interpret them. That's wrong. You have to interpret them. So if something goes wrong, it might be that you're looking at things wrong. Your perceptual systems are out. It's unlikely, but sometimes it's the case. But forget that. Let's say that you're looking at the world correctly and you know, your inferences about what went wrong what went wrong isn't the consequence of you misperceiving. It's a consequence of some stupid problem with your stupid plan. The problem is you don't know where the error is located. And that's why I think there's temperament. Sometimes if something unexpected happens, you should really freak out. Other times you should ignore it. But you can't tell which of those is true right away. So what happens is there's a distribution. When a little thing happens, some people really get upset about it and other people hardly care at all. And sometimes the people who get really upset about it are right and sometimes the people who don't care at all are right. And that's why there's variability in neuroticism. Okay, now, what you do when you're exploring is you start to decompose your plan, right? If, you're, if, you, if you can manage it, if you're not so like gripped by anxiety that you're paralyzed, then you go into your plan and you think, well, am I a complete like loser or is it some micro thing that's gone wrong and then you can start to decompose it and reconstruct your plan okay so yeah the other the other thing that this little diagram helps you understand it's like look what happens is when you're laying out a plan a motivated plan and a hole appears in it you have to figure out why you fell in the hole and then what you have to do is you have to take that motivated plan that's kind of running on automatic and you have to remember what it's made out of and so what opens up underneath you, when, when you've made a mistake, is the complexity of the plan. And then also, potentially, the complexity of the world, on the off chance that you misperceived it, right? You're just, someone might say, you're not understanding me properly. 
you know, maybe there's something wrong with you that's interfering with the perception. And then you have to do this massive search to try to figure out where the error lies. Now, part of the reason I believe that people stick to their beliefs so hard is because people don't like it when a hole appears in one of their big abstractions. Right? So they've got these high order representations of the world that are shorthand ways of representing something. They're sort of like axioms of faith. And if, they, if a hole appears in one of their axioms of faith, then all this complexity comes rushing up and it's overwhelming. And so people hate it when you <coughs> undermine one of their high order abstractions. And so I think I told you this before, don't do that in relationships. Right? It's best not to do it to yourself as well. I'll stop with this. These are medusas. And what, what happens when you see the medusa? Okay, so what, what, what might that mean? You bet, it's, the, it's a prey response. And so that's, a sort of, that's the sort of thing that occurs when you're moving towards your goal in your frame and the bottom drops out. It's like, uh oh, what's there? You don't know. So what's the logical first response? Well, if you're high in eroticism, it's going to be this. You're going to freeze. And then, and only then, if nothing else terrible happens to you, you'll start to relax a bit, and then maybe you'll start to investigate the structure of your plan, and maybe you'll start to investigate the structure of the world. And then, from a constructivist perspective, say, once you start to do that, you gather information from the world, and then you remake your plan, and you remake your conception of the world, and then you could move on. So, you do that under the guidance of the positive, and the negative emotions.